Hi, it's Terry with the 41st episode of this podcast. Today I'm chatting with Christopher Walsh, who is co-owner of Mad Lab Productions, an animation production company specializing in stop motion. He has also worked extensively in the stop motion television industry, and his own short films continue to screen at animation festivals internationally. Last year, he published his first book with Bloomsbury Publishing on stop motion filmmaking, and Chris has an MFA in film studies from York University. Plus, he is the coordinator of the Honors Bachelor Administration Animation Program at Sheridan College, and I had the pleasure of having Chris as a professor in my first year where he taught animation history and story. So, hi Chris, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. How are you this evening? Hi, Terry. I'm very good. Thank you very much for inviting me on. It's a uh, it's a real honor. I'm I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Yeah, you're the first uh, pr professor or somebody from Sheridan that I've had on this podcast. Even though I, I go there, <laughs> and I've had a lot of uh, alumni and and even professors at other universities. So yeah, I'm excited. Um, okay. So your journey is like very specifically interesting to me, not only because you teach at Sheridan where I go, but you're also in the world of stop motion. So you started out in stop motion and you've kind of come full circle. You went and worked on television productions, then you now you teach animation and you wrote recently the guide, the how-to guide on how to do stop motion. Um, and then recently you sold your own IP as Sesame Street. So um, I think that's amazing, but first things first, let's get some cat updates because you got a cat for the first day, <laughs> for the first time last year, and you used to give updates in class, and I missed those. So how how is it he? It is he. It's yeah. It's how's he doing? Silas the cat. Yeah. Silas. Silas is good. He uh, continues to bring chaos and happiness into our lives, and my kids often get to laugh at their father that runs around the house shaking his fist and using naughty words uh, at the cat, and they find that very funny. And uh, he lets us cuddle him sometimes, and uh, and he is good. He's healthy, happy. Yes, those cat updates were fun. They were fun for everybody. You guys seem to really like it, and uh, it was fun for me. We haven't had a, um, we've had hamsters and fish, but uh, our family hasn't had a nice, proper, furry pet uh, ever. So uh, that was sort of an exciting time for my family. And uh, and it was fun to share it with with you folks. It was sort of a nice, uh, nice little thing. Get the class yeah, started. Uh, a cat it's, update. Yeah. it's funny, like I posted on my Instagram story, if people had any questions, and like one of the first questions was like, can you please send us more cat updates? So when you get back to class, uh, you should uh, continue to do that. <laughs> I will do that. That's uh, that's a good idea. I, I think, uh, and in you know, in the animation program, I've come to realize too. I mean, there is typically so much affinity for animals in general yeah. and pets, and and the and you know what what animals and humans how they can connect and the emotional connection that's there uh, doesn't surprise me. People like to get uh, in animation. They like to get animal updates for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe you should teach a class on uh, animals in animation and then bring your cat and I'll bring my dog. And uh, we'll would just they get have... along? I don't know if they get along with that. Yeah, they probably would. They would. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see once you start teaching that class. Okay, serious talk. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to know, I mean, I kind of know because you've given us updates and kind of your history in class, but I'm wondering if you can share how you got into the wonderful world of animation. What was that dream that kind of propelled you into it? Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, well, it all goes back. You've got to you got to picture the mid '90s. All right, uh, it was a strange time. Um, so I started in live action, and uh, that was really my passion. And I was in high school way back when, and uh, I did a lot of live action stuff, and that met with some success. And by that, I mean you know little little festivals and little school things uh, that that were uh, you know telling me that they liked my work. And that kind of moved me towards thinking more seriously about filmmaking and uh, and motion pictures. And so uh, out of high school, I studied uh, film studies and English literature at Wilfrid Laurier University uh, in Waterloo. And that was a good experience, but it didn't really give me the production experience that I wanted. And I really wanted to move into um, into making stuff. So there was lots of theory and history there. And that was really beneficial, really enjoyable, but wasn't as production based. So then... I took a look around uh, at um, at colleges because I wanted that applied uh, applied training and Sheridan College's media arts program 
looked like the place. And so uh, I was fortunate to get into that program, uh, worked away in that, and uh, that was a, a very, um, really formative time. Um, I started to learn about lenses and lights and cameras and uh, built up a lot of production skills. And uh, from that, then when I graduated, I was working in uh, the live action industry for a number of years in lights and cameras and in uh, set design and set decorating on uh, TV shows and feature films. And then over time, though, my interest in animation was starting to grow and my interest in writing. So actually, my first interest in trying to bust into animation was as a writer. And uh, I started to, to set myself to that task. And from that ambition, I met some artists and one artist in particular, Alex Gorlick, who was a wonderful stop motion animator and uh, really one of the maestros of the medium in the world as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I met him because he was developing some stuff and, and wanted to do some writing work. So it was really through those sorts of strange paths that I then started to to find uh, uh, an interest in stop motion because he was a stop motion animator. And from learning more about the medium, from talking with him and spending a lot of time together, we lived in the same house. He had the ground floor, I had the attic apartment. We got to, to really, uh, you know, share a lot of stories and he got to, to help me understand sort of the philosophy of stop motion and a philosophy of animation and how magical it was. And uh, he's a real wizard in his own ways. And uh, he kind of started to turn me on to that. And that started to, to really make me think because I had these production skills uh, and the production skills were live action and stop motion really is live action. Uh, but it's a frame at a time and it's using the principles of animation. So that's how I started to learn about animation was was through stop motion and all the principles and all the essentials of animation came to me through stop motion and through uh, the training that I had. And that training was really self-directed and it was working with Alex and uh, turning over my little apartment into a little stop motion studio and uh, just sort of dropping out of the world and sinking into the idea of training and uh, and essentially apprenticing with him yeah. and getting feedback from him, working hard that way. And uh, that then led into commercial work because at that time uh, in the Toronto area, there was a lot of stop motion animation going on. And uh, the work that I was doing training and building a portfolio uh, led you know, nicely into actual uh, production work on television series. So a strange path, but at the same time, all kind of based on motion pictures and motion picture storytelling and uh, and eventually then into animation. So since then, though, I've developed other skills in in drawing stuff and in CG animation and so on. Kind of expanded out. Uh, Sheridan and teaching here has helped me with that. But uh, that's 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 yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the the bit of a summary there for you. <laughs> have you have you ever gone back to live action? Like, is there anything about live action that you don't feel satisfied with with animation or stop motion? You know what I've really come to admire and and long for when it comes to, to live action now having animated and worked in animation for so long is that uh man you can just turn on that camera and it rolls and so easy things to can make stuff move in live camera. action yeah it's uh it's amazing and it just rolls and if you're going to post something online oh my goodness you suddenly have a 20 minute video and uh look at you uh, as opposed to the labor but the difference is for me anyways, it's still, uh, you know, I love making stuff, but I also love that in front of the camera you can, and, and in drawn animation, CG as well, you are a, a world creator and you you are referencing live action, you're, you're thinking about live action a lot and, and the rules of motion picture filmmaking that were essentially established in live action. You are uh, having the opportunity as an artist to bring fabulous worlds to life that don't exist. You, you can do that as an animator in a lot of ways that are more economical, more feasible uh, than perhaps it is in, in live action, just because of budget costs and crews, and it can get really daunting. And that was part of what I was sort of getting frustrated with in live action, that if I wanted to tell stories and if I wanted to make worlds, how do I unlock all that money that's required? And how do I it, very daunting. As soon as I started to think about animation, though, and stop motion, it all became a lot more achievable. I could make these worlds and I could bring them to life and I could tell these stories through animation. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you, you mentioned uh, 
a couple things. One thing I never kind of thought about before was stop motion is kind of just live action one frame at a time, which makes total sense. And, and like I have a huge learning curve when it comes to lighting specifically um, and figuring out all the different techniques and, and whatnot. But um, you also mentioned that you learned a philosophy of stop motion animation. What exactly is that philosophy? Well, like I mentioned, the, the fellow that was mentoring me, Alex, like we, we would stay up late into the night talking about, you know, what it means to bring something to life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so, you know, we're talking about questions of theology, questions of divinity. I mean, this is some heady, heavy stuff, but I mean, that's that's where our brains were. You know, he, uh, he's got a, a, a big brain and uh, thinks deep thoughts. And so that really appealed to me. I loved, I loved where we were sort of going in our existential examination of what animation would be. And so that was a real gateway for me. If, if, it, if it was sort of bringing to life these questions for me about what it means to, to be alive, what it means to make something be alive. Uh, and I kind of bring that into my stop motion teaching at Sheridan, you know, this idea of, of, you know, in some real way, you're, you're giving life to things. Um, so, so when you're thinking about a philosophy of animation, um, I just think that there's, you know, there's great, like the simplest animation in any medium is wonderful to look at, you know, it's, it's just this, this life that didn't exist or these lines on a screen that that uh you know either have you connect immediately to a character or even if it's not a character just awesome motion that's moving around on the screen it uh it's a, a remarkable magical thing and then further with character animation the idea of of again you giving life to something and uh then beyond that ideas of performance and psychology and how you uh you know bring that out and how you begin to bring out layers of characterization within your characters through animation. Uh, so all these sorts of talks, they're, they're, they're philosophical in a sense, they're really theoretical, but here I was with this person that also had the practical skills, I had related practical skills, and now I was being able to actually take those production skills I had and apply them into the world of animation. So it was, it was theory, but it was also very practical. So it was, it really was its own sort of, uh, its own sort of, um, uh, school. It was like a school of one person, uh, really going deep into, uh, into what I would then realize was my training in animation. Yeah. So you mentioned a lot of things like bringing something to life and character performances, et cetera. When you're, when you're animating, um, how are you trying to connect with the audience through like, are you thinking to yourself like a really strong character performance is, is what's going to connect or is it the story or is it a combination of all these things? Like what is the heart of what's behind when you're actually creating an animation? I think it really depends on the context of, of what you're animating. So for example, if uh, you know, I, I still work commercially, but it's been some time since I've worked on an animated series, but in an anime, I always worked in TV. I didn't work in features. I worked in TV production. But in that context, you walk into your studio, you're, you pick up your folder. Inside your folder are your storyboard panels for the shot that you're going to do. You find your sequence in the animatic. You open up your animation software. You start to go through all the details of production in terms of setting things up, getting your puppets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in that case, you're maybe just working on a shot within the episode. Um, so in that context, you have a whole bunch of considerations in terms of staging, blocking, performance. It all needs to sort of work for what the storyboards are saying needs to work and what the context of the episode needs. But there's other things you're really not concerned with. You know, you really, and in some ways, there's some real freedom in that. You just say, no, I'm, I'm here to animate and make this look as good as I can. And I'm going to get the shot done and then everyone will be happy. I'll check it off and I'll move on to the next shot. And that's how I am doing my job. I am not concerned about the story. I am not concerned about other considerations because I'm in this, this uh, essentially, you know, assembly line, this production pipeline of making, uh, making this episode. If instead it's a, a, a one-off shot and within that shot, it has to be a really awesome little thing with a beginning and a middle and an end. And it's, uh, you know, in some of my little shorts that I've made, little zombie things, mm -hmm. those things are one shot and it needs to work as a little film essentially. So at that point, you now have a whole other 
pile of considerations. Now you're thinking about story as well as performance, blocking, staging, all those other things. Um, so sort of contextual, it sort of depends. When you ask me what I'm thinking about when I'm animating, um, it, uh, it really does depend. If I'm just animating something silly and fun, I'm thinking about engaging that audience and making sure that, that they get something good out of it. It might be a little joke. It might be a nice little bit of character animation. It might be just physics. I might just want to animate something that looks nice in terms of physics. But I'm always thinking about the audience. I'm always thinking about giving them the thing that I want to give them. And if in the end I play it back, it doesn't give to the audience what I want them to get, then it doesn't work. And you got to yeah. go back to the back to reanimate or to, to rethink things. So, okay, so let me ask you this. So you have, you know, you've worked commercially, you've studied animation through and through, stop motion specifically, you teach it, you teach history and story, you've made short films, you just sold an IP. If you had unlimited, and I know you like, you have like an affinity to create kind of like creepy horror short films too. If you had unlimited resources right now, what would you go and create given your knowledge of all of these different areas? like? Would you create something very personal to you, or would you create something that you think uh, is lacking in the industry, or something? What What would you create? That's a really, you know, that you, people get asked that question very rarely, you know, and so it's almost like being asked, "What would you do if you won the lottery?" Like you just sit there and rub your hands, and you go, "Wow, really, really, <laughs> that could happen? I could actually." And what would I do? Oh my goodness! So. Uh, <laughs> That's a hard one to answer. I guess, you know, if it's all unlimited, unlimited resources, man. Uh, well, you know, on the one hand, you think, OK, I, I've got some ideas. I'm going to develop my idea and I'm going to take it as far as I can because it's mine and it's from my heart and it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. And it's just going to be my special thing that's going to go out there into the world. Um, that's one way to approach things. Another though, and again, it's it's why it's so hard to just say, you know, this would be what I would do. I'm I'm just so, it's just so burned in that there are always conditions. <laughs> there are always right. uh, there are always borders to that canvas, or there's always you know edges to that sandbox. And uh, I function a lot better when I've got some boundaries and I have some some sense of things. Um, so I mean, another way to think would be an adaptation of something. Sometimes there's a real freedom in not feeling like it's got to be out of your own soul and out of your own, oh, toiling for this story. What if you could adapt something? Or what if you could connect with a great writer who develops something and you help develop that, but that it's this amazing story that someone else has crafted and you sort of help to, to oversee that and, and essentially to produce uh, that thing. Uh, that could also be very exciting. So not a specific answer for you, but in some ways, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. there's a lot of fun things you could do. Well, I, I always like to ask that question because I'm constantly thinking that over in my mind myself, like, what is that thing that I, that I am trying to achieve at the end of the day, you know, like working towards. So um, yeah. I like to hear what other people, because like from my perspective, you're a very, you know, you've been an accomplished animator you are teaching at one of the top schools in the world. You're a coordinator of the program there too. Like you've you've had a great career so far. So I, I can also uh, bench press nearly 100 pounds. Oh wow, that's uh, you need a couple more cats and you're um, yeah. you can bench press. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a lot a lot going on. Uh, well, thanks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, also part of what drives me is uh, I mean it's an amazing environment in the animation program at Sheridan. Like. Mm -hmm. um, seeing you know every year to see new students come in and see the passion that they bring and the talent that they bring as an artist on this side of things like yes i'm teaching i'm doing these things but that really inspires me to see what what energies students have and what they're into and the passion that they have for the medium that's always really exciting and it continues to be really renewing because you know you come out of sessions with students developing their projects and their ideas and uh it really is renewing. It's uh, it's it's an exciting environment to be in. I think part of why I I have been able to continue to do stuff and do different sorts of things is because I really do take that inspiration from students and I I see what they're doing and where they're going and I I can tap into that uh, that energy. It's uh, it's a really positive thing if you uh, if you can harness it and if you can kind of 
you know, ride along with it. It can be really good for you as an artist. Uh, while you're also teaching, it can be good for you artistically. I'm just picturing you harnessing the power of all the students and to create. Oh, don't get started. <laughs> there's, there is much potential. There's much to be harnessed. Yeah, there's, there's that. No, that's, that's much really good to So hear. much talent, so much talent. Um, so why don't we just backtrack a little bit? Can you, can you kind of um, just list some of the TV shows or whatnot that you've worked on just to give an idea? Sure, it's going back a little bit now. But uh, Henry's World was a show that uh, I worked on and... Uh, that was very fun. That was the first series that I ever worked on. And uh, it's about a little boy who uh, eats his uh, mother's mushy carrots and uh, everything he wants comes true and uh, he gets his wish uh, with, with some really fun characters in it and some fun stories and uh, a really amazing crew. So for a lot of the folks working on that, it was a Canadian production and it was shot in Toronto and uh, it was season two of Henry's World that I worked on. It did two seasons. I worked on the second season. And, uh, you know, for a lot of the folks on that crew, we all came into it with a lot of different experiences and a lot of different, uh, you know, production um, know-how, but also, you know, sort of new to the medium. We all loved stop motion, but it was, uh, for a lot of folks, their first time. And uh, that resulted in, you know, like real passion from the crew and a real sense of teamwork and a sense of, uh, of working together. And so it was really formative. It was really hard, too. It was really challenging production schedules that we were trying to meet. And uh, looking back on it, that was an awesome experience because it really, um, really threw us in, really threw me in. It really asked a lot of us. But the flip side was that it also gave a lot of creative control to the animators. And uh, that's what I was doing on it was an animator, but I had other responsibilities too. And uh, those included, you know, some work with sets and props and setting up the camera as well as lighting. We were all responsible uh, for doing our own lighting. So it had a lot of challenges um, just because of budgets, essentially, and deadlines. And that's the way it goes in production. You, 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 you work to your deadlines, you work to your budgets, and you, uh, you get the job done. So that was a very good experience. From that, I worked on other productions like um, there's a um, spooky show for CBC around the same time called What It's Like Being Alone. And it was this very strange, creepy uh, show set in an orphanage with all these strange little kids that can't get adopted because of how... Uh, how odd they are. They have strange powers and strange, it's a very dark, dark uh, sense of humor, really imaginative and really, uh, you know, sort of a, in a Tim Burton style slash Edward Gorey slash, uh, I don't know what other influences, but you can, you can sense the, uh, the vibe there uh, from that. So that again was a very intense experience. Great, uh, great in a lot of ways. Uh, then, you know, as an extreme from that, I've worked on uh, stuff for Fisher Price. I worked on a Fisher Price series for a show called Little People based on their uh, property. And, uh, you know, so very much at the opposite end of things. So from something really dark and, and weird and adult into something that was very preschool. Um, I worked on a show called Jojo's Circus, which uh, was a Disney production and uh, was about a little clown and her friends and her family. Um, and uh, oh, other shows and specials and, and so on. So a, a range of things over the years. Yeah. Quite, a, quite a lot of stuff. Um... Somebody asked us, what was your favorite project through all that? One of the questions I got. Yeah. I yeah. Remember. Uh, well, I think, uh, to be honest, I have to say, you know, it's the how formative Henry's World was and, and what, what a crew of people it was. And so many of them I'm still in touch with and that have gone on to really exciting things. And uh, and again, just to that idea of, uh, of a team, you know, and everybody really being bonded in that project as having to really work hard together to figure out how to do this. If I wanted to draw comparisons to the, to the animation program at Sheridan, it's a little bit like what's expected of students in their third year. I mean, you get training, you get mentoring, you get directions, you get milestones, you get delivery dates. This is when it's gotta be done and go to it. And you get advice and mentoring but it's really about working as a team. And if someone is, is, is falling behind or someone's struggling in the team, doing what you can to help them and uh, sorting stuff out interpersonally, looking all the time at how to, how to manage the project so it's getting done and it's looking as awesome as it can, uh, that really builds a team. And that sense of teamwork is a big part of what animation is. And so I'd look to that production. Yeah, that was like, that was just, a, again, it was my first production. And I think in some ways, um, the, the strongest sense of, uh, of team being built. Nice. Yeah. nice. And yeah, it sounds like that was very formative for you particularly. 
Um, you also mentioned in the 90s, uh, stop motion was kind of blowing up, but uh, I know it had somewhat of a downturn. Um, do you know too much about the history of stop motion, specifically here in Canada or in Toronto? Just yeah, from that sure. Point? Oh, yeah. I've, I've lived it. I've, 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 I've uh, been a part of, uh, of a lot of that, of the rise of it, and then, uh, then how it's sort of transitioned into where it stands now and uh and and where it's at today well there was i mean there was cup of coffee studios and cup of coffee studios was a a major um production house in toronto and its specialty was stop motion and so it brought in a lot of the series that i've just uh, mentioned uh were done at cup of coffee uh and that that brought a lot of work to toronto and it had a lot of artists that got trained up and uh and developed their skills in stop motion were able to develop their skills and then, you know, industries change and, and studios shift and change and, uh, you know, um, you know, things evolve. And so as that studio evolved into something else, which was, you know, just uh, not as oriented towards stop motion and uh, and was uh, ownership was was moving on to things uh, that then, you know, started to, to cause a shift in the amount of production that was being done in Toronto because it, it was such a major player. So with that happening, with the, the, the quieting down of things at that studio, that did cause a, a real shift in things when it came to production. And that saw a lot of artists in Toronto looking elsewhere. And uh, you saw a lot of a migration then moving out to the West Coast, off to Portland. So a lot of alumni from Cup of Coffee Studios uh, then uh, have found themselves at, uh, at Leica and have continued to sort of move themselves onward through uh, through the stop motion industry. But a lot of uh, stop motion artists owe their origins uh, to a cup of coffee studios. Yeah. So then as a result of that, you know, artists had to sort of rethink things and they had to diversify. So in some cases, uh, stop motion artists have moved into other areas. But stop motion is awesome for this one thing, and that's that's the fact that it has highly transferable skills. So it's very much, you know, a specific thing of hands-on fabrication, yes. But at the same time, there's nothing else like it in terms of like problem-solving skills and motion picture skills. You know, you're putting stuff in front of cameras and you are, you know, you are telling things through motion picture. And so those skills transfer over very well. So a lot of the artists uh, from Cup of Coffee have moved on to really exciting things. And I work the same way with my students at, uh, at Sheridan. You know, I'm a real devotee to the medium and it's so much what my passion is. I do all I can to continue to connect students into the industry. Um, but I don't make any, uh, you know, false claims in that sense. You know, students know that there's not a lot of employment opportunities for the medium. But if they have a passion for it, then they're going to follow that. And I always emphasize this idea of transferable skills. You know, the stop motion students that that succeed at Sheridan and do really nice work at Sheridan, it amazes me where they go on in the world of motion pictures, regardless of whether it's stop motion or not. It it uh, tends to build a level of character within artists that I think really serves folks well in terms of uh, fortitude and strength and uh they continue to prosper when it comes to the industry in toronto right now so there's a bit of a a, a chronology that i've charted out there with with cup of coffee it's moving into a very exciting period now and i can't wait to see where things may be going they're going there now, but where they might be going even uh, even into uh, the near future as we see things continue to evolve from what uh, what quieted down with Cup of Coffee. But we now see some of those Cup of Coffee artists coming back to the Toronto area or have never left the Toronto area and are starting to do more of their own work. You have studios like Stop Motion Department mm -hmm. uh, in Toronto, and I'm sure you you know of them, but they're doing more and more nice work. That's uh, Evan Derishay's company and Philip uh, Edel. And uh, they've got some really great uh, work that they've been doing and continue to do more. And they seem to continue to be uh, to be growing and uh, doing exciting stuff. There's also sort of little boutique stuff that continues to go on. There's stop motion artists around in Toronto that continue to work commercially. They're just working at a smaller scale than at a large studio. And uh, I would throw my company into uh, the mix with that, you know, sort of we call them boutique studios doing smaller projects for clients and the work is getting done. It's just in some ways getting done in sort of a different model than uh, from the large studio perspective. But as I said, as, as we're sort of moving into 
into the years now and as we look uh, to the future, I'm, I'm excited. There may be uh, maybe new uh, new developments uh, coming for the stop motion industry in Toronto and the the, the Toronto area in Canada um, in general. So so uh, we'll see. Do you think because um, so kind of the history is 90s were great. Then there was like a lull, which happened right when I was coming out of high school in 2007. Um, and now it seems to be picking up a little bit more. Um, they're still very like I've, I've talked to a couple studios in Portland that have kind of popped up the last, over the last couple of years, too, because it's booming there, too. Do you think Toronto has a specific or Canada has a specific advantage in stop motion they can offer um, versus uh, other geographical regions, maybe in the States? Yes, I do. And if you are an American company listening right now, I'm going to sell you on some of those <laughs> reasons. But uh, yeah, I mean, part of them, part of it is, well, I'd say there's two. There's financial reasons that make it look good from a perspective of a, a producer and also from a skill set. I mean, there's analogies you can draw with live action production. So Canada does an awful lot of live action production to an extent it's service work for American clients. And part of that is because of the the difference in the dollar. So uh, an American producer will get fantastic labor, fantastic production value for lower costs. It's just economics. And so uh, that's a serious consideration. But the other thing, and this carries to live action as well, really experienced crews. I mean, there's a reason why live action productions from the states are coming here. It's not just the dollar. It's because they can really count on production value and on really experienced crews that really know how to pull things together because they've been working for a long time in the medium. And so for stop motion, it's the same thing. I mean, we, we really do have some wonderfully trained stop motion artists in Canada. Um, and so those are, I think, two really, um, really attractive things when it comes to perhaps external investment in stop motion in Canada. When it's uh, from a domestic perspective, the dollar consideration isn't the same thing in terms of the, the economic advantage, but still that idea of really talented, very experienced artists. And I'd also say that to some extent, there's a niche that's that's there, um, you know, and and niches get filled and they get exploited. And uh, I think that, you know, stop motion continues to be popular in all sorts of forms for advertising, for feature films, for series stuff, because it's different. And, you know, when something is different and you know, I could sell the appeals of it up and down and left and right. But if we want to just say that it looks different, that's a very appealing thing. and if you can make the thing that looks different, uh, that's valuable. That has a, an innate built-in uh, value to it. So um, I think it's here to stay. And I also do really think that in these coming years, we're going to see uh, upswings and exciting stuff as far as opportunities in Canada. Well, that, that is encouraging to hear. I'm wondering what you would say to somebody who is thinking of going into stop motion, but just needs a little confidence boost in terms of like why they can be successful in stop motion if they pursue it? Well, when it comes to, to working professionally, I think I, I set out a few things there earlier just about, mm. you know, transferable skills. And I think that, you know, just again, the realities being what they are, there's tons of 2D animation jobs. There's tons of CG animation jobs. There's just simply not as many stop motion productions going on. And so there's just not as many jobs that are there. So you would need to be thinking about how can you diversify your skills and so if we're looking at stop motion at Sheridan, you know, our students are being trained in all sorts of areas. They really don't just come in and say, OK, to heck with everything else. I'm just going to be doing stop motion. It never works out that way. They've got all their digital skills, all of their their skills in all the other areas of animation. So that gives you a lot of not just transferable skills, but it gives you a lot of other skills to sort of turn to to continue to, to look for employment opportunities. So I would say make sure you've got your bases covered in terms of a, a range of skills that you could offer to a studio. Uh, but as far as a, a, a harder push, I think that you know when there are tons of opportunities, sure, you may not even be that passionate, but you'd say, okay, you're, you're willing to give me a job and I'll do this. I can move a thing around in front of the camera. Sure, I'll do this. Well, that's great if there's the luxury of, of those employment opportunities. If there isn't, though, I think it really depends on passion. And some students, in my experience, just get bitten by it. There's really no other way to kind of describe it. I, I'm going to sell it because it's my passion. I don't expect every student that I teach, and I teach a lot of students the basics of stop motion. I do not expect, and I also don't teach it that way, I don't expect that this now is your passion and you're going to head off into this direction professionally. 
it's great if you have that ambition, but you don't have to. It's up to you. And these realities are realities. But some folks just get bit by it. And sometimes it is the medium that becomes your thing, just like mm -hmm. your thing may become, if you're a musician, the violin, the piano. I mean, you're, you're going to be drawn to things, uh, no pun intended you know, for animation. So some folks are just going to move that way. And um, you got to follow that and you need to explore that and, uh, and see where that can take you. And I think for some people, too, they want to follow it because it really is a challenge. Some folks really like to be challenged. They really thrive on that. And in some cases, it's like a, a, a personal discovery for themselves to see where they can go with something that is challenging and that's hard. And uh, again, it doesn't mean that they're, they're uh, you know, being ignorant willfully of employment opportunities. It just means that sometimes you got to do something and sometimes you have to challenge yourself and sometimes stop motion can be that. Nice. Yeah. And, and getting bitten by it, the talk I had with Kevin Perry comes to mind because when he was at Sheridan and he just started doing stop motion, he was enamored by it. And look where he ended up in is now. He's just doing stop motion only. So um, yeah, he's an yeah. example. You know, I, I like I said, I've taught a lot of students and, and one of them is Kevin. And uh, yeah, you could tell that he was bitten. Like he would come in with stuff that he had done over the weekend or that he had done at night on his own in his own little home studio. And he would show me the stuff and it was already very good. And I, yeah, absolutely. I thought, wow, this, uh, this is someone who's not just taking it because he's got to take a class and he's got to get a credit out of this. He's, uh, he's for real. He's, he's really, somehow this is really connecting in with who he is as a human being and what, what is right down deep in his DNA. Um, and that was way back when, so no doubt about it. Yeah. So since we're talking about, uh, I guess, students at Sheridan, and since you are also the coordinator there, I'm wondering if we can just dive maybe briefly into talking about the program and, and um, a little bit. So uh, for students who, because I do get a lot of people who are interested in going to Sheridan listening to this podcast, uh, and also people at Sheridan listening to this podcast, over your years, um, what kind of attitude has somebody who gets into the program kind of had? That you've seen. Um, what kind of an attitude of the head? <laughs> yeah, what kind of attitude gets someone in the program <laughs> versus okay. like the technical skills and all that stuff? Well, you know, so it's a it's a good question, and what it sort of raises for me is it, it sort of highlights the fact that well, I'll try to I'll try to meet you halfway on that question because part of my reaction to that is. We don't really see their attitude because when it comes to the application process, it's it's a very, for the most part, cut and dry portfolio process by which you are required to create certain works of art to show your skills. And we evaluate that and, and there's your grade. So attitude doesn't necessarily doesn't doesn't overtly come into it. Um, once they're in the program, that's a separate question and, and a separate consideration. We could we, we could think about attitude at that point. But but uh, yeah, you're really you're just someone that's sent in your portfolio. I guess I could say that some things that rise up in in some portfolios is uh, a maturity. That can be a good thing, um, a way of seeing the world differently. And, you know, I was doing some <clears throat> portfolio review stuff just yesterday, actually, for for related programs at Sheridan. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, one student that sat down with me to show me uh, his sketchbook just had really cool stuff. Like he was really coming from another place. It was really distinctive styles and, and, and imaginative things. It was not a cliche and it was not a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of an idea that has been reworked and reused and uh, and just sat within the confines of genre or of of things that so many other people like. And so that's exciting. So, I mean, if, if you if you can call that attitude. Uh, so I guess it's like distinctive voices in applications yeah. well, can be really exciting. In your own, in your own yeah. style, it sounds like. Yeah, Maybe yeah. Or that, you've, that or that you've been able as an artist to move yourself through along a path far enough that you actually have something that's uh, that you would call a distinctive style. But even that style becomes very problematic because a stylish portfolio cannot do well for the applicant because it may be so stylized that it doesn't meet the requirements of how we're evaluating it. So style is uh, styles a really tricky thing. Yeah. 
You mentioned the word maturity. Uh, what exactly does that does that mean in the portfolio? Well, when I say things like transcending genre and 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 conventions, I, I really do appreciate that a lot of our applicants are maybe 17, 18, 19. So so they can only be where they are and they can only be where they are in their paths as humans and as artists. And so sometimes that means you are operating within genres and within, uh, you know, I don't it, cliches sounds very uh, condescending and I don't mean it to be that way, but, but, uh, but sometimes that that's where you are. So you can't pretend to not be there. Uh, but when you are further and when you are are moving beyond those those things, uh, that's appealing and and that's exciting and it sort of sparks uh, sparks something. You can't fake it though. Uh, so again, I'm trying to be mindful of, yeah. of uh, potential applicants listening to this saying, "Cool, I got to transcend genre." But um, <laughs> how do you define that? I think you just have to do the best work that you can at the state that you're at right now and uh, and and let it come through in the work. We also, again, like I said, we 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 understand who a lot of the applicants are, and we we understand that you can only be uh, sort of where where you're at in things. So, and and everyone on the this side of it that's evaluating portfolios have been there too. You know, we're we're very mindful of uh, of sort of where young artists are in in terms of maturity. It's a lot more about technique uh, when it comes to the portfolio uh, details itself. Right. So maybe um, <clears throat> say you say you've got accepted. You've seen into the program. You've seen students go through the program, start to finish for many many years. What is something that um, is is kind of typical for students to struggle with uh, at this stage of their life? And what would you say to kind of give them advice uh, to set them up for success? What's well, it's a very you know I I uh, I really make efforts to as much as I can try to stay connected to myself when I was at that age and at that stage of development as an artist and 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 I try to as often as I can remind myself of that and uh, it helps me in my job and it helps me in relating with students and uh, and working with them and um, you know at that time for me uh, it's everything is overwhelming I mean you are maybe away from home for the very first time I, I started orientation this year for incoming first years by asking them, do you know where you're going to do laundry? Like <laughs> you're already in the program, congrats, but do you know where you're gonna do laundry? Do you know how to do laundry? These are these are real questions and I'm not being condescending and I'm not being patronizing. Like these are these are like life altering things, man. If you don't have milk in the fridge and you you need milk and you, you want to eat cereal, where do you get it? These are, are really foundational, real questions, roommate problems, roommate issues, these sorts of things. So for, for first year students, especially, it can be a huge um, shock, not just to figure out where you're gonna do laundry, but also how to handle the, the pressures of this, you know, really high profile program that you've worked really hard to get into. And now you're feeling all this pressure upon you to be able to, to perform and you're looking sideways at everybody else, wondering how you stack up and, and often very convinced that you're not nearly as good as anybody else that's in the room. How do you then deal with that as a human and as someone who's trying to develop as an artist? How do you, how do you, you know, move through that or try to get over that? Um, I think, you know, I, I shared something with students a little while ago and I, it's a um, term that I've come to really like, which is compare and despair. So watch out, you know, you look at other people's work and you compare yourself, it really can take you down a bad path. And it's not just for young artists, it's for everybody at any stage in their lives, right? Look at what social media can do to you if you're looking at too many travel pics from uh, friends, you know, how that right. makes you feel. So thinking about your own work, thinking about your own development is really important for students to keep their eyes on the prize and that is their own personal development. Um, and then time management. It's a really intensive program in terms of deadlines, all sorts of assignments that are always uh, always coming along and, uh, you know, keeping your eye on them and making sure that you're working on them. That's real time management. And uh, and you really have to stay on top of that and you have to be able to yeah manage your time. It's it's super important as much as learning perspective and learning life drawing and, and figuring out the principles of animation, all these essential things you're going to be learning in your coursework can you make the, the deadlines and can you be working on stuff so that you're not pulling crazy all-nighters and and are able to sort of stay alive and, and healthy 
uh, as you deliver all this stuff. It's great training for an industry that's so much about deadlines. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And the, especially the time, well, for me, as a, coming in as a mature student, the time management thing rings true the most for me because I, I know where milk is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Good. yeah, so um, what would you say to those who are thinking about pursuing a career in animation? And, and you know, uh, thinking about school can kind of be overwhelming and do I have the chops for it? And is this a viable career? And I'm getting pressure from you know, my parents or other people to go into a different uh, path. What would you say to those overall and just thinking about animation as a career? Oh, there's a lot of different things that you can do in the world to make money. Uh, you can learn a skill. And I mean, I've got, I have a nephew who right out of high school and even then barely out of high school had a lot of mechanical skills had a neighbor that was a mechanic on big truck engines and started to hang out at the mechanic shop started to learn more about mechanics and engines he had a skill at it he then got enough training after school to to qualify him in whatever way the employee needed him to but that was it. And he had these massive skills when it came to mechanical abilities and working on engines. And man, he was making good money quickly. And you cannot look at that. I can't look at that as an adult and as a, a father and a husband and, and all the, the stages I'm at in life and think about how, you know, how important financial security is and look at the path that my nephew took and not say, that's awesome. That that's that is I am not saying it's better than taking a formal route, but if you've got a pathway through to stability in terms of employment, uh, it's a good thing. Don't don't turn away from it. So when to bring this back to animation, because it's not a engine mechanics podcast, right. uh, if you're into animation, if that's your passion, if you're good at it and if you're good at at storytelling and at motion and at drawing and at art, um, you know, you you have an industry that's there that has employment opportunities. It's a, you know, as we record this right now, and I'm always very careful about that because industries can rise and fall and they can shift and they can move. But as we record this, it's a strong industry in North America and it's a strong industry in Canada. So there's employment opportunities that are there. So yeah, I talk to lots of moms and dads, you know, because we do a lot of open houses at Sheridan and uh, that's that's some very valid questions that they have. Like, are there jobs for my kid? If my kid goes into this, can they find employment? And uh, again, it's, it's a fortunate thing right now to say that there's lots of work. There's opportunities there uh, for people to, to get jobs. I was showing some work to uh, students in another program uh, just the other day um, uh, at a studio in Toronto that has job listings. And I took them into the job listings on the company's website. And I said, here you go. You, you may not be in the animation program, but here's a job listing. Here is specifically what they would want you to be able to show that you can do. And if you can do this, you're a, a viable candidate. And take a look at these skills. Do you have them? How could you gain them? Can you acquire them in different ways? How can you achieve this? You know, uh, formal education has a ton of value. And, and you know, I'm not going to not say that the Sheridan Animation Program's is uh, not a great place. It's got great values to it. And it's a great program. Sheridan is a great school. I went there as a student and I was working after I graduated very quickly. It's, uh, it's great that way. And formal education has a lot of value to it. But um, just look for opportunities and i would say though in animation that yeah there's 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 work now now you also need to be prepared as you look at a world of animation and, and a future in animation and realize that you know you often hear in the news these days that oh no one uh, you know there's there's it's a gig economy what's that really mean and if you're talking about an animation industry it's sort of the it, it's as with a lot of media production it's gig based by nature you know it's not something that's just begun in in 2018 when they started to use the term uh it's about short contracts in some cases short contracts sometimes longer sometimes opportunities where you're employed at a company for years on end 
uh, but not always. And so there is always a, a turnover that's happening. But again, when you're looking at an industry that is busy and is uh, vibrant, there's opportunities. One job ends, your other job's lined up pretty quickly, or you use your network and, and connect with folks and you turn next to that studio and, and there's, uh, there's opportunities. Again, I'm seeing all this in a, a time right now where there's, uh, there's, there's work to be had. Not, again, I'm not speaking specifically about stop motion. We're talking about the medium of animation and opportunities within animation. No, but I think I think that's still really good and encouraging to hear, regardless of uh, what medium you're thinking of going into. Um, so, well, thank you for sharing that. And and some, I think I should have asked this before, but maybe we can just backtrack and go through uh, what stop motion facilities and equipment and stuff Sheridan has, just for people who are interested in pursuing stop motion. I know it's a little bit sidetracked from the from the discussion, but. Um, can you run me through the opportunity specifically of stop motion over the four year degree? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, once you're uh, accepted into the animation program at Sheridan, uh, then the opportunities for stop motion are primarily they begin in third year. There's some workshop opportunities in second year, but primarily it, it begins in third year. And in third year, there's a, a foundational course that all students take. And it's an introduction to stop motion. So every student in third year, in the fall of third year, takes an intro class to stop motion. And uh, it's essentially an animation course. So it's not so much about puppet making and fabrication and that sort of thing, or filmmaking even. It's about applying the principles of animation that you've learned in years one and two. And now you're applying it in a new way, in a new medium, and you're having to sort of contend with those principles in similar ways, but also in different ways. And uh, so that begins in third year. In third year as well, there's the opportunity. So third year in the program at Sheridan is very much about group film work. So you're taking individual courses, but most of those courses kind of feed into a group film project that you make over the whole school year. So there's the opportunity in third year as well to sort of put up your hand and, and, uh, and say that you want to be in the stop motion production. And we have a, a stop motion studio that's dedicated to our third year students. So within that studio, there's production space for fabricating puppets and sets and props. Uh, there's mentor meetings that you have with mentors that uh, will help you specialize your skills in stop motion as you develop your story that you're going to turn into stop motion. There's a shooting studio. We have two little studios uh, where you can be uh, working in in your group. When it comes to the software and hardware and all that stuff, um, it sort of is is what you would see at a lot of um, commercial production houses. So we shoot with digital still cameras. Uh, we like the Canon cameras. They're very user friendly and they uh, they they serve our purposes. Nice lenses. So we use Canon cameras, and uh, those Canon cameras connect to uh, Dragon Frame uh, software. And uh, those are those are sort of the essentials when it comes to the the production side of things. But then we have a, a nice array of of the other other required elements. I mean, we've got uh, you know good studio lights. We've got uh, the grip stands and the bells and whistles and all sorts of other sort of paraphernalia that comes along with uh, with stop motion. We've got in uh, in senior so that's anyways that's third year, and uh, we also have a, a course in uh, we call advanced stop motion which happens in the winter of third year and that has more of a puppet making uh, objective to it so uh, that is a, a course that you can take as an elective course regardless of what skills you have or where else uh, what other training you have and you get to design a puppet you make a puppet you design a prop you make the prop and then you animate both of those things and uh, you learn lip sync for stop motion and you learn other aspects of stop motion as well in that specialized course uh, then in fourth year if you're still crazy enough to want to do more stop motion, then we have a dedicated fourth year stop motion studio. And in that we have three individual studios and each of those studios get uh, allotted to a student in fourth year that has uh, put up their hand and has uh, said they want to work in stop motion and, and uh, is uh, qualified. They get studio space and uh, as well as uh, again, production equipment. And uh, we have some nice camera rigs now in fourth year. Uh, that allow you to do, uh, you know, frame by frame camera moves in and out and up and down. And uh, as well as all the other uh, equipment that I described before in third year. And uh, there you go in your studio space and you get to make your independent film. So in meaning you're on your own. So well, with mentoring and support, but uh, 
you know, uh, as opposed to the group film, you are now making uh, your own film. So that's that's uh, there you go. That's what you that's what you get. It's quite a lot. <laughs> and is. also, um, so Sheridan kind of is primarily well, maybe not primarily, but a large part is focused on two D animation execution. And then um, I'm in second year right now, and we're getting introduced to three D as well. Yep. And then in third year, you get introduced to stop motion. So. Um, it sounds like, and I already know this because I used the studio over the summer, but all you basically have all of the equipment for a full-fledged stop-motion studio there. There's the headlights, you mentioned the rigs, the camera, etc. And uh, it's quite amazing, I think, the amount, like the professional quality you can create with uh, the equipment there. It's not just, if you want to take it seriously, it's not just make some tests, you can actually make a full-fledged like studio level stop motion film and i've i mean i've watched like so many of the theses these stop motion theses that have come out of, of sheridan and they're quite impressive so um, it is it's a good facility i i really am proud of it and and uh and the work that we do we have an awesome studio technologist uh aldina zapparoli she's uh yes, right. Sheridan, and she's she's very talented and great with cameras and lenses and uh and has been managing the studio for uh, years now and so uh you know, she's a, a great asset to our ambitions uh, for stop motion. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, we got a good setup. That's a nice thing. You know, Sheridan really is supportive of technology and uh, and of tools and providing tools. And so they'll uh, they'll support that. And so then that means that that programs are able to uh, to, yeah, stock themselves up and get uh, get some good equipment to allow students to really uh, take it as far as they can. You would know that you uh, you you you. Uh, Got yourself in there, and you were you were uh, when I say taking advantage, I mean it in the best way possible. You were you were using that equipment and doing uh, really nice stuff with your uh, your Duck Wizard film. So yeah, I I almost I wish so when I came out of um, high school, I was really looking into the different stop motion programs, and um, uh, Eric, who runs the Montreal Stop Motion Festival, I actually ended up reaching out to him right out of high school, and he mentioned that uh, you have a full stop motion, uh, I guess, courses at, at Sheridan. But at the time, I, I, like, I didn't really understand too much about it. So I wish, I wish I knew that there was like a full fledged studio that can be taken advantage of at, at Sheridan. I might have come a little earlier. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, your podcast will get the word out there, I guess. But uh, the other the, the other tricky thing that that is a bit of a challenge is that when it comes to uh, acceptance at Sheridan in the animation program, yeah. again, you know, uh, stop motion is an aspect that unlocks for you once you've gained admission into the program. But it is uh, it's not a component when it comes to the application. I'm fine with that. It's not a, I it, it's uh, I think that stop motion is very well well. Um, well represented within the animation program but again I'm a realist and I'm an, an industry realist and it's great we've got great facilities great opportunities for students that want to pursue it but the realities are the realities there's a lot more 2D jobs out there and there's a lot more CG jobs so when we look at these essentials that we look for in the portfolio, uh, that's that's something po folks should be aware of is that even if you're a real diehard stop motion fan and and passionate about it, that doesn't mean that you get four years of nonstop stop motion in the animation program. And in fact, in order to get in, it is still so much about drawing skills that that yeah, really yeah. is the essential thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that. Um, I'm thinking back to when I put together my portfolio and I, I put some of my stop motion in there, but I almost didn't because I was worried that it wasn't very relevant to the application. So <laughs> I, I did take it very seriously and did like the 2D animation and all the other drawing assignments and stuff. And uh, I just submitted the stop motion as my personal, couple sure. of personal pieces. So yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we can just uh, switch gears and talk about Mooga Loops a little bit, just cause that's kind of an exciting project for you very recently. Um, first of all, what can you, for somebody who hasn't seen it, can you give like a Cole's notes on on what it is and how it happened and all that stuff? Sure. Yeah, the Cole's notes. It's funny because Cole's notes is about uh, you know abbreviating something longer, <laughs> and these things are so all so so short and so simple because they're for a preschool audience, right? For Sesame Street, so right. they're yeah. they're really simple. So yeah, I think I can do that. Yeah. So you have to give the opposite of Cole's notes. Yeah. I'll, notes. Let, me, let me stretch it out a little bit here. Uh, so yeah, the show is called Moogaloops, which struck me as just a very funny 
word and very silly and I liked it. And then actually out of Mooga Loops came uh, the character's name, Mooga. So Mooga is a little blue clay character and uh, he lives in a little he, she, it, they. It's, it's a little blue character that lives in an alien landscape that's very gentle and very pastel-y and uh, you know, coral reefs was one of our inspirations for designs and for colors. So it's very uh, deserty, uh, pastel, very soft. And uh, he has a little companion, and it's a little box. And that box has a red button on top. And each episode, Muga looks at the box, looks at the audience. So there's a narrator as well uh, off screen that sort of interacts with Muga and says, come on, do it. Push the button. Push it, because something good is going to happen. It's going to be fun. Do it. Do it. Do it. And uh, Muga always pushes the button. And when he pushes, I call him he, pushes the button, uh, something appears. And uh, it's educational. So in the one episode, first episode, it's uh, we did three episodes. The first one, uh, a little friend appears. And uh, he gets to play with that friend and learn about movement and about counting. Uh, another episode is about art. So a little easel appears and a pencil. And uh, magical things happen. And, and uh, so it's sort of like a art training episode. And then in the third episode, it's about music. So musical instruments and uh, and singing songs and playing music. So so there you go. Well, first of all, congratulations. I think it's uh, quite amazing what you've done. And we were it's funny how we were talking about the industry before and how uh, Toronto and Canada has a, an advantage to the U.S. And, and you've kind of done that. You've developed, pitched and sold a stop motion based series to a major network in the U.S. Um, which I think is quite rare and amazing. So congratulations. But it's it almost ties perfectly into what you were saying before with uh, kind of how where the industry is going. Um, mm -hmm. So how did how did well? Thank you for sharing about Moogaloops too. Um, how did you go about pitching it in the first place? Um, so not just Sesame, but you know a lot of uh, a lot of networks and and. Uh, I call them entities. I don't know. You know, uh, players, were, uh, buyers, broadcasters, depends on, on who, who you're talking to. But uh, interested parties will put out calls, you know, calls uh, for pitches and uh, looking for submissions for, for properties. Uh, and that was the case. And, and you know, beyond just sort of a, a, a general call out, we had some, you know, I, I, I do uh, Mad Lab Productions with... Uh, my business partner, it's Jerry Bertolo, who's a, a graduate of the animation program uh, as well from uh, in the, back in the 90s. And uh, so with Jerry and I, we have we have our connections and, and uh, Jerry's been working in the industry for a very long time and uh, he's pretty well placed and he uh, he has good connections. So we uh, we had some good relationships when it comes to to. Um, uh, to Sesame and to to moving us forward a bit that way. And uh, from that, it was a pitch. It was a, a very simple pitch process. And uh, I think what appealed to Sesame was the simplicity. You know, how I just sort of described it to you, it's uh, it's it's simple. And, um, and I grew up on Sesame Street, so did Jerry. And uh, not literally on Sesame Street, but, uh, you know, yeah. real totally devoted. I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's a DNA thing. It's like right in, in us. And, uh, so we could go into a Sesame street state of mind pretty easily. And, uh, we've worked a lot in preschool, you know, commercially and Jerry's done a ton of animation productions and he's directing, uh, now and, and, and continues to direct series for television, uh, for various studios. So, we we have a pretty good understanding of the market and of uh, of of what sort of works doesn't work for that audience. You know, you 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 have really particular parameters when it comes to preschool and um, and what they can uh, what they can understand, what they can um, appreciate, but not just for the audiences for um, for the folks that maybe are buying that or are looking to to produce that or see that developed. So uh, we put together a nice, clear, efficient pitch. And uh, from that, Sesame was impressed and uh, the conversation carried on from there. And uh, in the end, we had a deal. And part of the deal was also then uh, producing uh, the episodes. Gotcha. Did you so you mentioned before that you kind of thrive when there are boundaries in it. And so Sesame put out this pitch and you saw it and thought, OK, let's create something within this. Did you have confidence that you that it would go far? I. I'm not going to be falsely modest. 
so I'm going to say, yeah, I did. I, I, you know, I, I can't say that for all things. I mean, you, you, mm. for everything you cook up and everything you imagine and everything you try to, to throw up in the air and, and hope something happens with, you dream and you hope and you, you wish the best for it. But as you go on as an artist you and as a commercial artist, you know that it doesn't all stick. It's not all going to come back, but that's why you get a lot of things going is, is uh, that you want something to stick. So I know that, and I know that it's easy to, to uh, think something's great and then it doesn't work, but uh, I thought it was pretty good. I did. And I, and I really thought like it was a, a property that we had kind of cooked up previously uh, for our own purposes. And it just sort of been sitting on. And um, when the opportunity came, I thought this is, just right for this particular partner um so no no uh it's uh, it uh felt like it, it was going to find the right home and uh that it was going to be a thing and um and then lo and behold so i think part of that though also comes from experience and having worked in it a lot and uh and you know kind of knowing what what's going to work what's not going to work and and having faith in certain things and so uh yeah i, I thought it was gonna thought it was gonna have a bit of success yeah yeah. So you mentioned also you you've uh, worked in preschool before and and I guess you had some sort of confidence that this would do so pretty well. Were there any challenges that you faced that you might not have expected or or whatnot with this project? There's challenges every day on it. Um, I think part of that, though, comes again with experience and, uh, you know, our, our core crew, um, they're experienced and we've been working for a long time um we're not just out of school so we've got a lot of experience under our belt and a lot of experience working with clients as well and um and meeting the needs of clients and and uh and working with clients efficiently and effectively so that you're you're giving them what they need and that they're happy and that they're satisfied and you're also finding ways to to meet your production deadlines so the challenges were every second of every day on it, as simple as they are when you watch them. Uh, they're they're supposed to be simple. They they they're meant for a very young audience that uh, that's happy with simple things, but they come off as simple and as 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 easy because we made them work effectively. Like uh, there's nothing easy about anything you see in there. It it was uh, efficiencies and experiences when it comes to production that, uh, you know, so it, it allowed us to kind of keep it under control, I guess is what I'm saying. We, uh, we've all been, we've all been working long enough to have seen some nasty stuff when it comes to production and, and production management and deadlines blowing and, and, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff that you absorb all that. And those are strong lessons. And then when the opportunity comes to try to run things differently for yourself, you, you draw on that wisdom. So, uh, yeah, there was unexpected things at every point, but um, we were able to manage it and uh, and see it through. Yeah, great. Are there more productions in the near future coming from you guys? We'll have to see. <laughs> so okay, yeah. well, let me just ask you in general, what's what's next for you? I mean, you're newly coordinator of Sheridan's program. You also teach. You've got this production that came out. Um, uh, I know you've done freelance on the side, stop motion for some toy companies and whatnot. What's next for you just going ahead? Uh, I'm I'm definitely in a day at a time mode right now. And by that, I mean uh, the coordinating position in this program is, uh, I keep describing it as a, a great professional challenge. And uh, it's a diplomatic way, I guess, to say that... Uh, it's it's a lot to handle, uh, but that's a good thing when it comes to prof professional challenges. It's a it's a, a new chapter for me professionally. So I knew going into it. I mean, I had a good amount of training for it and, and worked closely with the previous coordinator, Mark Mayerson, who uh, is a really, you know, again, that's someone for your listeners to look up. I mean, such a, an experienced animation artist, uh, all kinds of uh, experiences and uh, a real um a real voice in the world of animation that uh, that real mentor to me in a lot of ways too. Uh, I had training from him. He was the previous coordinator, so I worked closely with him to sort of uh, onboard myself for it. Uh, but part of coming into it was uh, a decision on my part is that I'm you know, I tend to when I decide I'm going to go in at something, uh, I go in with uh, I'm all in 
you know, I, I if I'm making a decision to accept this offer of uh, a position like that, then uh, I'm all in. So I'm sticking with that right now. Um, it uh, it's my main thing, and uh, and I, I, it's going to continue to be my main thing. But uh, for the the time being, that's my uh, that's my thing when it comes to the commercial work with Mad Lab and uh, other opportunities that might come my way as a result of the the Sesame Project. That can be very much, again, like sort of a case-by-case -case thing. And as opportunities present themselves, we run our company, Mad Lab Productions, in a very, uh, I would call it nimble sort of way, meaning modest overhead, modest expenses. And so when we need to gear up or crew up, we're able to do that. But in between times, uh, we can uh, run along pretty lean. And so we look for opportunities, wait for opportunities. And so that can kind of come, you know, into play when we see opportunities. So for me, the main thing right now is uh, is coordinating, absolutely. Nice. Well, that's good for me to hear too as a student. <laughs> I don't want you to slack off and then suddenly... <laughs> any other animation students listening to this uh, yeah. hearing that I'm about to I leave? I also didn't hear any cats in the work, doing. so uh, <laughs> people will be wondering about that. <laughs> um, is there anything else you wanted to share? I think that kind of wraps up uh, everything I wanted to chat about. People should definitely, definitely buy my textbook. Yeah. Yeah, that 100%. If you, uh, if you, I, I better not. I was about to make a joke about if you want to get accepted at Sheridan, you have to buy it. Oh, but someone will make it anyways. For saying that. I have a, I, I have a copy of your textbook and it's quite excellent. I, um, I've read through the entire thing actually, uh, right. and I have a lot to learn when it comes to specifically to puppet making and and uh, character performances because. That's yeah. something that I haven't done before, but yeah. Oh, and now I can say to students, just look it up in the book. Leave me alone. Yeah, you don't have to teach anymore. Just no, the puppet <laughs> fabrication part of the book, I have to just, again, I'm not chilling things too hard here, but, uh, well, first of all, it's four years of my life, so I guess I could be shilling it as hard as I want. It was a, a real challenge. Um, but uh, I'm proud of it, and, and I'm really proud of the puppet making section. And part of it is because I was fortunate enough to work with Brenda Baumgarten, and she's I worked with a lot of great artists in that book, and and you'll see them credited uh, throughout um, for their contributions. Very fortunate with all the artists I worked with, but Brenda especially, she was so generous in her time. And Brenda is a really key player in the puppet department at Leica. And uh, now I worked with her prior to her employment at Leica. I'd known her from working in the Toronto area and on uh, all sorts of productions. And uh, she's really established herself as an amazing puppet fabricator um, with all kinds of very specialized, awesome skills that are, are really super valuable. And uh, I, I was really fortunate she agreed to work with me on the book. And and man, we really dug in. And I said to her, I want this to be, you know, a lot of production books when it comes to fabrication show you a few ingredients and then they show you a finished puppet. And it would drive me nuts when I was learning how to make this these things because it wasn't enough. You know, I, you really need to see step by step and how to make these things and you need the material lists and you need every single step. That's what it should be. And she was in for that. And so uh, that's how we approach things. Then she's hired at Leica. And uh, I'm all the more uh, proud because I can say, you know, this 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 pipeline in terms of how to make these particular kinds of things of puppets, these these assets, it's uh, I stand behind that process, man, because that's Brenda and uh, Brenda's one of the world's top uh, puppet fabricators. So I'm particularly proud of that section because I really can stand behind it. And I think it was a real gap in in what's out there as far as uh, training for stop motion artists. So I hope it, uh, and I'm, I'm using it all the time. I use it in the stop motion group uh, that I mentor at Sheridan, uh, the how to's for the puppet fabrication and our fourth year students too. So uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that section. Yeah, and I think, I think it's also quite an accomplishment to produce kind of the first uh, like beginning to end guide on stop motion. I didn't, I don't think there's anything else that really matches what you've created at this point. Um, and also, I really enjoyed it. It was just an easy read. It's not like text heavy and like complicated stuff. It's just very straightforward and easy. And I actually had my laptop open the entire time because you referenced so many great films that I had never heard of before. So I'd like stop reading and then I'd go and like look up the film and watch it quickly and be like, oh, that's what he's talking about in this. So yeah, awesome. I, I definitely. Oh. Awesome. I was that's just gonna say I encourage anybody who's into stop motion to get a copy. It's just wonderful. That's awesome. Well, that's great to hear. And, and you know, I I wrote it for the medium of stop motion, you know, I, and I wrote it for 
people that are passionate and determined to get good at doing this, uh, it's it's for them. It's all written out of the passion that I have for the medium. And uh, so I do really hope, and as a teacher, I really do hope that it's a, it's a resource for people to really help them move themselves forward. You know, we talked at the beginning of our chat about how you can learn stuff and how you can get in. And I'm very aware of how competitive the animation program is at Sheridan and how difficult it is to get in. I hate the thoughts of, of anyone that wants to learn animation seeing themselves blocked off just because they can't get into any particular program in the world. And when I use my example of you know how I started to learn animation, it was really self-directed. It was really about deciding for myself that this was something I wanted to develop and I wanted to, to pursue. And I, I went for it, you know. Uh, so if that book can help someone that's not in a formal program or that's not able to for whatever reason or isn't at a point in their life where they can consider something like that, uh, I do hope that the book can can help with that. It's uh, it's a big part of being a teacher. You want to uh, you want to help people move themselves forward. Excellent. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share just as we wrap up? Just as we wrap up, Terry. The only other thing that I would have to say to you uh -oh. is that you, you still owe me for an assignment from first year. Do you remember that one that you didn't hand in? I'm just kidding, Terry. I was like, what? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, gonna, I, I'm still going to have to change your grades. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's no, uh, no. You're, you're, you're a solid. I won't publish this episode then. <laughs> you're, you're a solid. Uh, you better publish it or I'll, I'll change all your grades. No, I would never do that. <laughs> No, you're a solid student, Terry, and you're a solid guy. And uh, and I think that there's a lot of, of attributes that you're showing off that I think should be very inspirational for students. I mean, you come in with uh, your skill sets and with your experiences and your maturity, and that's that's undeniable. But you're also coming in eager to connect the dots, eager to to find ways to make things beneficial for you and to try to move yourself through in a in a mindful way and it's not always easy depending on where you're at in things and, and again I wouldn't say this is even just for our animation students in the program at Sheridan anybody listening if you can think about strategies and if you can think about ways of moving yourself from this point to that point to this point again you referenced someone like Kevin Perry that guy knows how to strategize. And and it doesn't have to be that you've had access to the greatest schools or that you have unlimited funds or that you're ultimately connected to the best players. It's that you can stand outside of your immediate situation and try to see your situation and try to understand how you can strategize to move yourself along. And that can be for anybody at any age, at any point in their pursuits. So uh, good on you, Terry. Well, thank you very much for saying that. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly thinking about how to try to connect the dots with what I'm doing because, uh, you know, I have a I have a past career. I have a lot of uh, reflection that brought me to the point where I am right now with this podcast and school and everything. So yeah, thanks for reflecting that back at me. That's that's really nice to hear. You betcha. You, so well, and, you are going to publish this po podcast. <laughs> okay, now that you say that, I will. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if that's if that's everything, then thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. Awesome. Thank you very much, Terry. It's been really fun. Thank you. If you're listening to this podcast and you have specific questions about Sheridan College for Chris, please email him at christopher.walsh at sheridancollege.ca. Or if you'd just like to follow Chris and check out his work, you can do so by going to his website, which is chriswalshanimation.com or his Instagram or Twitter, which I'll include the links to in the description of this podcast. I'll also include a link to his book on stop motion filmmaking, so you can check that out too. And that's all for now. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, bye.